I, I realized a while back that I had gone through a process when I was in my 20s that was akin to something Descartes did. I'm not trying to compare myself to Descartes. Um, but he was, he was trying to look for something that he couldn't doubt. And the consequence of his search was, I think, therefore I am which I don't think is exactly a good translation of what Descartes meant. I think he meant something more like, I can't dispute the reality of my own consciousness, something like that. And that's good. Um, that isn't where I got to in my contemplations. I was looking for something that I regarded as incontrovertible. And I was fortunate at that time because I was reading Alexander Solzhenitsyn and Solzhenitsyn wrote the Gulag Archipelago, among many other things. And the Gulag Archipelago is a description of the absolute catastrophes of the Soviet state and the entanglement of the individual psyches of the Soviet citizens in that catastrophe, their descent into deceit and cruelty, deceit, resentment, and cruelty. And Solzhenitsyn said in the Gulag Archipelago that he thought the Nuremberg trials were the most important event of the 20th century and the reason he said that was because the Nuremberg judgment for better or worse was that there were some acts that were so viciously brutal that there was no excuse whatsoever for engaging in them no matter who you were or what your culture was or what your rationale was and so for for Solzhenitsyn the Nuremberg trials established what you might describe as the transcendent reality of evil. And that's an unbelievably useful thing. It's akin to this idea of suffering in, in my estimation. And because, well, it's the child in, the, in Auschwitz problem. It's that you need an answer to the problem posed by the suffering of innocence as a consequence of malevolence. You say that's, that's, a, that's evil, the, the conscious exaggeration of unnecessary suffering. And that gives you a vantage point. That's wrong. Whatever it is that is, that's wrong. Well then, you have a place to stand. You can say, oh, okay, now. I know that there's something that's wrong in a non-trivial way, in a way that can't be just dispensed with, with rational objections that emerge as a consequence of contemplation of the boundedness of life. Those answers aren't serious enough to address the issue. Well, so I thought, okay, well, I found something that I can grip onto or stand on without dispute. There are acts that are unquestionably evil. And that means that there are acts that are unquestionably good. Now, it doesn't mean that we know what they are, right? Because just because you know one pole of something doesn't necessarily mean you know the other. I could say that whatever leads us as far away as we can possibly get from Auschwitz, that's good. I've been trying to puzzle out what that might be for 25 years to outline it in a practical manner, I suppose, and, a, and an abstract manner. To understand if there's a root, a, a mode of being, let's say, that takes us away from undue suffering, but more than that, takes us away from undue suffering multiplied by malevolence fundamental existential problem of life. We all suffer. That's the meaning of life. We all suffer. The suffering is exacerbated by the malevolence in our hearts and the malevolence in the hearts of all of us. And the paramount issue that faces us is what to do about that. And the answer is, I think, live a life that manifests itself as meaningful. 
because it seems to me that the meaning isn't a, a rational phenomenon. It's not something that you create. This is where Nietzsche, I think, got it wrong. He believed that as a consequence of the death of God, we, had to, we would have to create our own values. We would have to become gods ourselves, so to speak. But I don't think that Nietzsche was right because I don't think that we can create our own values. I think that we have to discover them. And I think that what we discover are eternal values. And I think that the eternal values that are discoverable are precisely the values that lead us away from the pathway to perdition that was characterized by places such as Auschwitz. And I also think that we all know this. Now it's not that we can't question it because we can question it, but the questioning is in some sense beside the point, like the person objecting to the grandeur, grandeur of Beethoven's Ninth by pointing out that it's going to end. The questioning is beside the point. It's missing the point. I've studied a variety of great psychologists, Jean Piaget and Carl Jung and Freud and Carl Rogers, many of the great 20th century clinicians. And and my sense is that along with the biologists and the evolutionary psychologists that we're, we're starting to map out the pathway that might be the, the opposite of the catastrophic mode of being that leads us into pits of hell like Auschwitz. And that there's something genuinely real about it. Like seriously real. Metaphorically real and literally real. Both at the same time. That the instinct to meaning that you experience, for example, when you listen to something great. That, that, that experience of meaning that overcomes you isn't some epiphenomena. It's not something, some mere reflection of some more fundamental process. But that which is more fundamental than anything else. You say, well, you can't deny that pain is real and suffering is real, and you can't deny that suffering induced by malevolence is the worst of all possible sufferings. Those are all undeniable as far as I'm concerned. Those are all meanings of life. And, and they're real enough so that if you encounter them, like if you encounter true malevolence, the probability that you'll walk away from it unscathed is very, very low. It will damage you psychophysiologically, and you might never recover. And that's real enough for me. Well, is the path away from that real? Is the path that transcends that real? Maybe it's more real. That's what I've come to believe, as pessimistic as I am about the nature of humanity, myself included. As, as real as I believe suffering and evil to be, it appears to me that the mode of being that leads you away from that, that enables you to bear the suffering with nobility and to be useful to others who are in pain and to constrain the malevolence in your own heart and around you, that that mode of being is more powerful than that which it is set against. And not only that, I think that we experience this. I think we experience it. We just don't notice. Maybe because we're too busy thinking. Because noticing and thinking aren't the same thing. We see in our own lives when we're engaged in something deeply meaningful. Music is the best pathway to that, I think. It's the most, it's the most rapid and indisputable pathway to that everyone, virtually everyone loves music. And music speaks of meaning. It, it, it does it directly. It shows you what life would be like if it was ordered and harmonious and you were dancing along with it properly. It gives you an intimation of psychological integrity. But you watch your lives day to day, week to week, month to month, you'll notice that there are times when you're so deeply engaged in what you're doing, when what you're doing is so meaningful, in the, in, in, the kind of meaning that announces itself, not the kind that you're creating, that life is so meaningful, you think, this is worth the suffering. You think, well, that's meaning, right? Meaning is what makes the suffering worthwhile. <laughs>